I'm Tim, welcome to Watch Want, and thanks for logging on. Today, we're looking at an early Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Chronograph, reference 25721 Ti, 42mm in titanium. You can see this offshore, and if you like, buy it on our website, watchyouwant.com, and if you like these videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Watch You Want Inc. Now, we've received requests for reviews of an early offshore, and I had to wait for the right one to come across my desk. And this outstanding 25721Ti really gives you an eyeful of what an early, original series offshore would have looked like. While not one of the absolute earliest watches with the D serial number, this mid-E series represents the original dial, represents the original movement, represents the original look and feel of the offshore, essentially as it debuted at the 1993 Basel World Watch and Jewelry Fair. Now you can see 42 millimeters is its nominal measurement, but it reads, even in its early form, as so much larger. 42 on an offshore is the greatest fib ever told. These watches wear with incredible stance, presence, height, and span. On my wrist, six and a third inches, 16 centimeters in circumference, you can see I'm just barely able to accommodate this beast, and it is a beast. 42 millimeters, the fact that it has a conforming bracelet with conforming lugs on both sides means that I would have to size it down all the way to get a nice secure fit, but it does sit securely, just. If your wrist is any smaller than mine, so smaller than 16 centimeters, you're probably going to want to get one of these on a strap. The good news is these early double plot offshores can be converted to current offshore straps. The older strap borne or notch case offshores that don't have the double plot links cannot be converted to work on modern offshore straps. So if you've got an early one on a bracelet, you can put it on a modern strap. But if you've got an old one on a strap, you can't put it on a modern strap or bracelet. That's kind of how it works. Now this one has a beautiful full titanium bracelet and being made of titanium, it is considerably lighter on the wrist. Now the steel version of this feels like precious metal and the precious metal version of this feels like a Buick. It has a lot of stance in anything but titanium. It also has a ton of mass. This one has just enough substance to satisfy without overpowering. Now you can see one feature of the offshore that really hasn't changed is the fundamental shape of the Emanuel Guide designed case. The gorgeous hand bevels, the camphers that spread and taper outward as they approach the flanks of the lugs, the taper of the bracelet that's almost too incremental to see in any individual link. You can see the slope of it, but I can tell you as I run my fingers over it, I can't even feel the steps. It's just like a continuous curve. Even with the gaps between the individual links, I can barely feel the differentiation between them. That's how beautifully, finely, and precisely it's finished all by hand. This is where you're finding the value of the offshore. In all of the hand labor that's invested in the finishing of the bracelet, of the bezel, and of the case, and of the clasp. This is an outstanding example of a lightly worn early offshore. Now you can see, I'm going to focus on one of the items that's characteristic of the better kept older offshores before I go back to the clasp, but you can see that the individual bolts of this watch are actually less than flush with the bezel. They are still subsurface, and that's Audemars Piguet's reference point for bezel replacement. The bolts are actually supposed to be slightly inset, so sunken in a little bit. When it gets to the point that the bolts start to rise out of the bezel from refinishings, that's the point of replacement. This watch is nowhere near it. Speaks to a benign existence in collector ownership. Now going back to the experience of wearing the bracelet, I find that it aesthetically completes the watch. The bracelet is one of those eternal, enduring features of the design that will never be revised. With the exception of some detail revisions to the clasp over the years, the look and the feel of the bracelet has not changed, and everything's executed to the highest standard. You can see, even on this early example, it's a twin deployant with a clasp, so once you close the clasp, this clasp clamshell locks it down and makes it virtually seamless. As you can see, like a Rolex oyster, uh, rather crown clasp, when closed, you can barely see the parting point with the exception of this polished and engraved AP right here. Now the case back of the watch, AP Royal Oak Offshore, you can tell this is not one of the absolute earliest examples because those didn't say AP or Offshore, but it does give you a sense of the early dials. Now I talked about the difference between the strap notch cases and the plot cases, but I want to talk a little bit about the difference between the dials of these originals and the modern ones because that's where they stand out the most from an aesthetic standpoint within the bezel, not without. So I'm bringing in a relatively recent 
This one is an H series, so roughly 2011 to 2013, Royal Oak Offshore black themes. And here we can see all of the contrast in, well, glorious detail. You can see the plots, known as the blob indices of the original on the left. The blob indices were the original demarcations of the hour track, and they opened the dial up visually. It was a little bit less crowded. And I want to focus on another element that became magnified on the later examples, which was the mega tapisserie cut of the dial. You can see the hobnail to the right on the black themes is much more expressive, bigger, blockier, with a more tangible three-dimensional aspect to it, whereas on the original, the look of the tapisserie, the, the hobnail cut of the dial, was more of a texture. It was more in line with the original 1972 Gerald Genta dial design, so there's more of perhaps a family resemblance with its inspiration here than here, but this perhaps represents the Royal Oak design coming into its own, and this perhaps represents its first steps into the world both classics, both appealing, but very different. Now, another aspect that changed, as you can see, is the treatment of the subdials. They became a little bit more unitary, being more like a conventional chronograph in that they would have one color, either all black, all silver, a contrasting or monotone treatment with respect to the main dial. Here you can see on this principally anthracite dialed example that there is a central disc, there's an outer race, and then there's a chapter ring and each one contrasts with the one flanking it. So again, a different treatment here. You can also see that the, the hands themselves are different, these being just a bit larger, just a bit brighter. Everything about this watch is just a little bit more legible in the dark. Now I want to focus on movements because although you can't see them, the movement distinctions between these two watches are quite striking. Now this example would use the JLC 889 based Audemars Piguet caliber 2226 with the 2840 Dubois de Praz chronograph module. This one retains the Dubois de Praz chronograph module, but it upgrades to Audemars Piguet's 3126 movement. Now each one has its merits. This one has an anti-magnetic shield, meaning that the entire movement is encased within a soft iron cage, which is also a Faraday cage, so it will actually conduct magnetic fields around the movement. The AP movement, although it has a longer power reserve, 50 to 55 hours here versus 38 to 40 hours here, the AP is too big to fit inside that inner cage, so AP dispenses with it on the in-house movement. Now this operates at 3 hertz, so 21,000 vibration, 21,600 vibra vibrations per hour. This one operates at 4 hertz, 28,800 vibrations per hour. This makes do with a bigger balance wheel to compensate. This runs a smaller balance wheel faster. This has a balance cock with a mobile stud. This has a gyromax style balance on a full balance bridge, so this is secured with variable inertia balance blocks for fine regulation. This uses a Triovis micro adjust on a mobile stud for fine regulation. They're as different as different can be inside. This is perhaps the higher of the high horology options. This perhaps is the finer, thinner movement, magnetically shielded, and truer to the origins of the original Royal Oak and Royal Oak Offshore being powered by JLC movements. So this one for tradition and anti-magnetism, this one perhaps for technology and durability. Each one has a personality and advantages all its own, but you can see that the collector's perspective is that each one is valuable in its way because they tell the story of the greatest oversized sports watch of modern times. The watch that arguably blew up the sports watch scene in 1993 and gave birth to everything from the Hublot Big Bang to the Rolex Deep Sea, but you can only be first once, and that flag flies forever at Audemars Piguet and Le Brasseau. This is the Royal Oak Offshore, reference 25721Ti, 42 millimeters, E-series, an entire, entirely cast in brushed titanium. You can see it, and if you like it enough, you can buy it on our website, watchyouwant.com.